Hello and welcome to Human Ascension with Ellie. The other day, I was posting with fury on my Threads account, and that's because I was really fed up. So let me explain why. The presidential debate has taken place, and I had watched the debate with my lovely viewers on the Ellie Dreams and Under channel on YouTube. We did a live event in which I streamed the Australian uh, live stream of the CNN live stream. <laughs> it was very complicated and, and a bit glitchy, but somehow we made it happen. And it was great to watch the show with everyone and to read the comments in real time. Now, I'm not exactly an expert on how to run a presidential debate, but I do have eyes and ears. And in my view, CNN really botched the debate um, event in a spectacular manner. They had two moderators, neither of whom were permitted to fact check the candidates. All they were actually permitted to do, it seems, was ask questions, which makes me wonder why it was necessary to have two moderators at, at all. They can only ask one question at a time, you know. The moderators ended up looking a bit silly, and I do suspect that both of them are probably hoping that their performances as moderators um, is quickly forgotten over time. They let one presidential candidate tell over 30 lies without being fact-checked on the spot. And the other candidate didn't appear to have his microphone working correctly or his earphones, and he was left very disadvantaged by having to focus or try to focus um, on his policy points and do the moderator's job of fact-checking as well at the same time. And even trying to remember half of the nonsense that was coming out of his opponent's mouth with all of those lies, which went entirely unfact-checked. It was impossible for him to do. It was frustrating to watch. And another thing that wasn't obvious at the time, but which appeared to be the case later on, was that the candidate who was seemingly in control of the debate appeared to have been taking some kind of performance-enhancing drug that was causing his pupils to dilate, even with the super strong television lights shining in his eyes the entire time. Now, obviously, I'm not certain, and I am definitely not an expert on these things, but I had just been watching a chat between a YouTube political commentator and a psychologist with around 30 years of experience working with ADHD, ADHD patients and studying the effects of the treatment drug um, for ADHD called Adderall. Now, Adderall is a drug that works well for ADHD, but it can also be abused. When used correctly, it calms the patient down, gives them short-term clarity to be able to communicate more effectively, and it stops them from fidgeting. But it's also a drug that is commonly abused or, you know, just taken incorrectly. And so the talk about um, this was quite interesting. One of the things that the psychologist mentioned was that Adderall causes, causes a person's pupils to dilate and that he had been studying one of the presidential candidates and had noticed that his pupils were frequently dilated in situations that would generally produce an opposite results result, like having television lights in your eyes. The psychologist even went further and explained how he believed that the presidential candidate in question is showing all of the signs of being a habitual abuser of the drug Adderall. There has been a lot of gossip about this being the case for decades as well. And so I, um, I couldn't help but notice that the candidate's unusual behavior at the debate seemed to coincide with what I'd seen. After the debate, I asked my viewers to provide me with high-resolution photos of the candidates so that I could see for myself. And yes, it does seem as though one of the candidates might have been on something that appeared to validate everything that I'd seen the psychologist talk about um, just a few days earlier. I actually did a video about it on the Ellie Dreams and Under channel. Um, about this and other topics related to the debate. Uh, and if you want to view that video, I'll provide a link in the description info for this episode. Now, I, I'm not an expert on any of these things. And so, you know, it's only just that it raises questions. And so, of course, you know, I'm talking about it. Now, I started off today's episode by saying that I was typing with fury on my Threads account, not because of the debate, but because I was getting really fed up with all of the worry and panic that was taking place immediately after the debate. Good grief, you'd think the world was coming to an end. 
especially when it came to the media and some of the political pundits, they they actually went so far as to almost uh, cause complete chaos on one side of the political spectrum with the 24-hour coverage of how worried and panicked they were. And, And that's what had me utterly fed up. It's actually still going on now. That's why I was furiously sending out posts on threads because the worry was becoming its own fuel and the worry of a few, I would say, cowardly, panicked people was spreading worry and panic across to everyone else because that's what worry does. It's like praying for something bad to happen. And if enough people worry themselves silly about one bad debate or another single incident, regardless what it is, all they're really doing is praying for bad things to happen. And what happens when you pray for bad things to happen? Well, as it turns out, generally, bad things happen. And you don't have to take my word for it. Um, This is the opinion of experts throughout the worlds of science and also esoteric teachings. So today, I want to talk to you about worrying and what worrying is really about, what it does to you, to your environment, and the impact that it has on the energy around you. Because what I saw this week was a masterclass on the power of prayer and the power that worrying has to become a prayer for bad things, bad things that could happen. This is a really important aspect of being human and seeking human ascension, because for as long as we humans are going to continue to let our anxieties and chronic worrying rule our lives, then we're going to be preventing ourselves from rising to a higher realm of existence. The psychologists know this, the scientists know this, and the world of esoteric wisdom has known this for thousands of years. So let's discuss so that we can know it too. I really hope this episode helps anyone out there who needs to realize just how self-fulfilling worry is and who might need assistance in being able to shift their mindset in positive ways. Okay, so first off, what exactly is worrying? Well, worrying is a form of thinking about the future that leaves you feeling anxious or apprehensive. It's a chain of thoughts and images that are negative in nature and might even seem relatively uncontrollable. Worrying is a bit like trying to engage in a mental problem-solving exercise about an issue that that might not have a certain outcome or a certain outcome, a definite outcome, but one or more of the possible outcomes could be negative or unwanted or unpleasant. And so when we worry, we're actually focusing on the possibility of whatever bad things might happen. And often our worry is a kind of fear-based process. And because it's fear-based, it ends up resembling the kind of bodily response that a wild animal might have when it's suddenly confronted by a predator. The animal will experience a primal instinct that we commonly refer to as fight, flight or freeze. So, actually, when a person worries, they're in a suspended, long-form version of fight, flight, or freeze. They're in a heightened state of alertness. They're conscious of every potential risk or threat around them. They may not be able to sleep or eat or concentrate on other things that that, uh, surround them. They might be experiencing heart palpitations as their body gets ready to run on the spur of the moment if needed. The blood flow in their body is suddenly directed towards their limbs, which means that the blood flow to the brain is reduced. This means that their body and their mind is optimized or are optimized for sudden physical movement, like if they have to flee the area on a moment's notice. But the fuel for the mind is diminished, which means that the person or the animal is no longer capable of thinking as clearly as they do when they're in a calm and relaxed state. So often they begin to experience illogical fears based on their diminished brain capacity, which then fuels their worry even further. It puts them into this suspended form of diminished brain function, a bit like they're stuck in a prison of worry that they can't get out of. You see? So let me ask you a question. Do you think it's possible that a wild animal 
that has suddenly been confronted by a predator is thinking about all of the positive things that might be happening in the moment, the wonderful meal that they've just finished eating, the beautiful flowers that they can see in bloom all around them, the gloriously warm day with just a hint of cloud to cool the gentle breeze? No. It's likely that the idea of anything positive is nowhere near their mind in that moment. Even if all of those positive things exist and are right there blatantly in front of them. Instead, the wild animal is desperately trying to figure out whether to run away, fight for survival or play dead. And that is what their body and mind are optimized for at that very moment. Their brain can't acknowledge the beautiful day or the flowers, or the comfortable sense of satisfaction in their belly. They are in a panic, and that's all that they can focus on. That's what worry is. It's a state of panic, just like what's experienced by a wild animal confronted by a predator, except it continues on and on and on. It keeps your mind focused on fight or flight. And it directs the blood flow to your limbs and away from the areas of your brain that process logical, reasonable thoughts. And it makes you blind to the positive things around you. Now, don't get me wrong. Worry can also serve a purpose in the right circumstances. And if it's managed effectively, worrying is a natural response to ambiguity. When a person is placed into a position where they they don't know what's going on around them or when they don't really know what's about to happen next, then they might begin to experience a sense of anxiety. Anxiety is a form of fear. And so the person will automatically be hardwired to reduce their fear in the way that they can. And the way to do that is to find a solution to the ambiguity so that it can be resolved and become clear again. And so the person will naturally begin looking for ways to do that. They will begin asking themselves, you know, what if I do this? Or, or I wonder what's, what he meant by that? Or what if this happens next? Or, um, what if, what will happen if I try this option or that option? The person's brain is running possible scenarios, uh, looking to see if any of the scenarios might provide a solution to help resolve the ambiguity. Once a solution has been found that the person believes um, they have a chance of using to resolve the ambiguity, then they can implement that solution. So, for example, they could ask the man, what did you mean by that? Or they could try the various options that they thought might help and see if, in fact, they get clarity from doing that. Or they can just accept the situation as it is and decide to live with the ambiguity because sometimes things aren't always clear. And so maybe they'll accept the situation and refocus themselves onto other things. That's sort of the healthy, normal way to deal with an issue that creates worry. You do have that initial response of fix it, you know, in some way, but you may also have to move on as well. What isn't healthy or normal or even useful is to dwell on the worry about something that has the potential to become negative or which is ambiguous, if after running the scenarios um, of how you can control your circumstances has produced no tangible results. Once you're in a pattern of suspended panic, where your fight or flight impulses are heightened for long periods of time, and your brain's capacity for logical thought processes has been starved of blood flow for an extended period, then what you're doing is you're simply circling around and around and around. And you know, you know what happens when you circle around indefinitely? Well, you get dizzy, but you end up wearing yourself out. You wear out your mind, your body, and your sense of overall well-being. And the issue that got you worrying in the first place is permitted to trample all over you at leisure. By chronically worrying about something, you end up giving it control to dominate your existence. It makes you weaker and less able to resist the negative possibilities of whatever might enter into your reality. But also, there is a saying out there that I've heard a few times in my life, and I think it's really true uh, and really easy to remember. And um, 
And that is that worry is like a silent prayer for the things that we don't want. It's so true. It's as if we're sending our thoughts and emotions into the universe, hoping that they won't manifest. But also sometimes worries can become self-fulfilling prophecies. And so it's really, really important to focus on positive intentions and to take proactive steps to address whatever it is that concerns you. So <clears throat> let's see. Worry is a silent prayer for the things that we don't want. I really like the idea of looking into this um, saying and, and how it's interpreted in different type by different types of experts. So let's do that. Okay. All right. So firstly, let's look at worry as a form of negative thinking. So when we worry about the future, we produce a chain of thoughts and images that leave us anxious and apprehensive as if we uh, continue to do this to ourselves when something uh, doesn't quite go to plan, for example. The negative thinking that accompanies worry can have detrimental effects on our mental and physical health. Um, it can contribute to problems such as social anxiety, depression, chronic stress, and low self-esteem. The stress can manifest as symptoms, physical symptoms, such as headache or migraine, um, reduced immune response to diseases, um, back or other kinds of joint problems, even skin irritations, hair loss, vision impairments. Cancer is also linked to prolonged stress. The list is terrifying in itself. And so, and it's so well documented that stress and physical illness often go hand in hand, that, uh, that alone should be sufficient incentive to find ways to avoid worrying excessively about anything out there. But worrying as a form of negative thinking can also begin to take us down a really dark path where we begin to experience catastrophic thinking, which is an actual thing. <laughs> it happens when a person immediately begins to make assumptions that the worst possible scenario is about to happen just because something didn't go to plan. So let's put that into the context of what happened regarding the recent presidential debate. Thinking about the people and other entities that immediately jumped to proclaim that one of the presidential candidates should resign or be replaced simply because he had a, a bad day. Now, who was thinking catastrophically in that moment? It was a panicked, negative thinking response by people and entities that overreacted to a single event. And even if the presidential candidate in question has a bad day every day, there's simply one person in a wider presidential administration. So let's get real here. The presidential administration comprises of a cabinet of officials who are actually the people responsible for the most high level functioning of every administrative department within the presidency. Those people consist of, and this is a long list, I'm going to name them all so that you can see, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Treasury, the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, the Secretary for the Interior, the Secretary for Agriculture, the Secretary for Commerce, the Secretary for Labor, the Secretary for Health and Human Services, the Secretary for Housing and Urban Development, the Secretary for Transportation, the Secretary for Energy, the Secretary for Education, the Secretary for Veterans Affairs, the Secretary for Homeland Security, the Chief of Staff, the Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency, the Director of National Intelligence, the Representative for US Trade, the Ambassador to the United Nations, the Chair of the Council for Economic Advisors, the Administrator for Small Business Affairs, the Director of the Office for Management and Budget, the Director for Science and Technology Policy, and the Director of the Central Intelligence Agency. That took me a long time to say, and that's because there's 26 different cabinet positions, all except one of which is headed up by a departmental leader who was either directly elected by the people into office or was confirmed by a bipartisan Congress. That's a very steady and consistent set of high-level leaders guiding the United States 
and their way forward on every aspect of its existence. The president could be dead, and it would make very little practical difference to such a steady cabinet. What the president does is that he seeks the advice of each of these cabinet heads, plus other advisors within his administration, so that he can act as a single figurehead representative to the collective wisdom around him. And if he, for any reason, couldn't do the job for a day or a week or a month or even ever again, then the vice president would immediately step in to retain continuity because that's her job. So what exactly is the panic about? The panic is simply that. It's just panic. It's either panic for the sake of getting ratings or for the sake of fear-mongering or for the sake of getting on television or having something explosive to say to get more clicks on your YouTube or X account or, or on Instagram. Or it might be panic by a person or entity that doesn't know how to regulate their feelings and doesn't practice mindfulness or simply has a chronic worrying problem that they want to share with everyone so that they don't have to feel it alone. The problem is paying too much attention to people or entities who panic and enter into worry that turns into negative thinking, whether it relates to the presidency or even something less public like money or health or relationships, serves no purpose other than to create and spread more panic and more worry that manifests as negative thinking. And maybe that's the point. Maybe the point is to get people to worry as much as possible because chronic worry makes people weak. And maybe the whole point is to make the people weak. Who knows? So don't fall for the trick. Recognize it for what it is. It's negative thinking that serves no purpose, no positive or practical purpose at all. But there is more to worrying than just negative thinking. The concept of worrying as a prayer for bad things can be linked to the idea of a self-fulfilling prophecy as well. The concept of worrying as a self-fulfilling prophecy is rooted in the psychological theory of self-fulfilling prophecies, which states that our beliefs and expectations can influence our actions in a way that makes those beliefs come true. Yes, science says that worrying can actually make your worst nightmares come true. And guess what? It's not just something that only happens to individuals. Self-fulfilling self pro prophecy of negative outcomes is something that can and has happened on a massive scale on more than one occasion. You know, a real life example of this um, kind of self-fulfilling prophecy happened around 100 years ago. It's very well documented and it ended up affecting the whole world. The event I'm talking about is the bank failures and the stock market failures during the Great Depression that occurred in 1929. The Great Depression lasted for around 10 years, affecting the entire world, and it all started with a self-fulfilling prophecy by a group of people who let their worries take over. So the Great Depression was actually triggered by a combination of factors that took place in the United States. It was like a perfect storm. Firstly, the 1920s was a time when consumer demand began to slow down, which led to a decrease in manufacturing. The people had also been borrowing more money than they could afford to realistically pay back. The US stock market had experienced a period of artificial growth, which had been prompted by certain high level investors playing tricks with the stock market so that they could maximize their profits. This happens today as well. The stock market had become full of stocks that were trading at an inflated price that they weren't genuinely worth. So the snapshot at the time was that the US was in a tricky position where it was gambling on everything going smoothly, like it was sitting on a precipice of a cliff and waiting to see which way the wind was going to blow. As it happens, the wind blew in the wrong direction. <laughs> and this is where the self-fulfilling prophecy uh, began to kick in. There were two sets of rumors that began to infiltrate the business world um, that 
metastasized into a contagious and highly toxic panic event. The first related to the US stock market in which certain key stocks were tipped as, you know, tipped as having been artificially inflated. So investors began to panic and started selling their stock um, in order or selling their shares in that stock to avoid losing on their investments. The second uh, happened at almost the same time and involved rumors that the banks were running out of money. So the ordinary people who were already heavily in debt also began to panic and started rushing to the banks to withdraw all of their money in anticipation of the banks running out of money. What ended up happening is that the stock market began to wobble under the pressure of the panic and the banks that would normally have had more than enough money to, to cover any normal degree of money withdrawal that takes place were taken by surprise by the sudden panic um, of, of withdrawals of, by so many people. And both of these institutions that provide a foundational structure for the US economy began to fail. This, of course, led to even more panic spreading as far as other countries. And before the world knew it, the whole economic system of world order was collapsing. It sparked an international economic crisis of mammoth proportions, which resulted in a depression that was only ultimately resolved around 10 years later when World War III kicked off, which served to increase government spending and help to restart the economy. In the meantime, people in the United States and across the world, even people who had previously been safely wealthy or prosperous, or even sensible with their finances, they went broke, or they became homeless, they lost their livelihoods, and some of them even died, all because of panic and the worry that had become a prayer of self-fulfilling prophecy. Something very similar happened in the 1990s uh, with the banking crisis, during which the housing and mortgage bubble burst, leading to another worldwide economic crisis that lasted, thankfully, not quite as many years as the Great Depression. And, and yes, it was devastating for those who were affected, nonetheless. But it's another example that can be seen. Also, there was Brexit, the Brexit vote of 2016, in which millions of Britons voted to extract the UK from the European Union on the belief that the relationship between the two entities was fraught, which ultimately caused the relationship to indeed become fraught. And it caused chaos to the UK economy and political systems, which is still being felt today. The UK still hasn't recovered from Brexit. And that was, you know, eight years ago. These examples illustrate how powerful beliefs and expectations can be and how they can shape reality in significant ways. It also underscores the importance of responsible information sharing and the potential consequences of misinformation. So let's bring this self-fulfilling prophecy topic a little closer to home, maybe even so close that it's lying right next to you in bed. Okay, a bit uncomfortable, but let's do it. How many relationships, including marriages, break up because one person is unreasonably jealous? The answer to that question is lots of them. If you are married to a person, well, you have to trust them in order to live a happy and content life with them. There will be some times that will be hard times because life is never perfect for long. Perhaps the issue will be related to money or a difference of opinion or because of external factors like accident or illness or interfering family members or, or the question of how to raise the child or division of chores or who the dog loves more. You know, you never know. It could be anything. But if there is trust between partners, then the marriage still has a chance of surviving because trust is the bridge of strength that keeps the union from breaking. But if one person begins to live in the marriage with a sense of doubt about the other person's faithfulness, for example, it can cause havoc in the relationship. The jealous partner will begin to imagine all kinds of worst case scenarios. If the other person is running late coming home from work or takes too long returning from the store or smiles at someone attractive in the street or even looks at somebody else for too, you know, for a second too long. 
Their words will be closely scrutinised. The pockets of their jackets and jeans might be searched. Their phone records might also be scrutinised and their friends and family may be quizzed in really weird, uncomfortable ways that end up being reported back to the person involved. And that will mean that both of the people in the relationship will become nervous and jittery as though they each have to walk on eggshells with each other. Every facial expression will be questioned. Every word will be doubted. And that's an exhausting way to live. It just really is. So with time, patience will begin to wear thin and arguments will occur. It will be leading to accusations and hurtful words and storming out or sleeping on the sofa or whining about each other with your friends and family. And then someone will blab about what they heard one person say about the other person and and there'll be embarrassment and lots of pride issues and one-upmanship and you never know. It could keep going, could even go as far as revenge. Regardless of how it happens and whether it's slow or fast in its delivery, all of that chaos began with a self-fulfilling set of worries. Is he having an affair? Does she really love me? Is he getting bored with me? Is she flirting with that guy? Does he have a secret? Is she going to leave me? Eventually, the answer will be yes, she will leave or he will leave because they just can't take it anymore. The relationship has become a ruin of what it once was and nobody is content or fulfilled in the relationship and they're anxious and they're angry and they're stressed out. They might not even realize why the relationship broke down. But it could very well be because somewhere in that relationship, a seed of undue worry that became a self-fulfilling prophecy was planted. A silent prayer for bad things to happen. And the funny thing is, <laughs> actually, it's not, it's not really that funny, but the person who gets left behind in the relationship might even say to their friends later, you know, I knew my partner didn't really love me and that one day they would leave me. They are such a liar and they're such a sociopath because they said they loved me, but they never meant it. <laughs> but the fact might be that that person really did love you. But your addiction to the self-fulfilling worries that consumed you also sparked a series of events that ultimately drove them away, fulfilling all of your prophecies. Of course, relationships involve more than just one person. And so everyone in the relationship has a part to play in the breakdown of that relationship. But for the purposes of today's episode, it's a good practical example of another self-fulfilling set of worries and the harm that it can do to a person's life. However, it's also important to note that not all worry leads to self-fulfilling prophecies. Worry can also serve as a motivator to prepare and plan and to help us to avoid negative outcomes. I'll talk a little about how to manage worry in a healthy way later in this episode. So we have covered how worry can be a form of negative thinking. And we have talked about worry and the role that it serves in self-fulfilling prophecy. But there is another concept related to worry that is equally worthy of being raised. And that is the idea that worry is linked to the universal law of attraction. The law of attraction is a philosophy that suggests that our thoughts and emotions can influence the reality we experience. Law of attraction is a theory accepted by science, including psychology, but also the esoteric wisdoms relating to how the energy of the universe works and the interconnectedness between all things. There are three main principles related to the law of attraction. The first principle is referred to as um, like attracts like <laughs> and relates to the idea that things which are similar will be attracted to one another. So, for example, people tend to attract the attention and interest of people <clears throat> who are similar to themselves, but also that people's thoughts tend to attract similar results. In the like attracts like principle, 
negative thinking is believed to attract negative consequences or experiences, while positive thinking is believed to produce desirable experiences or consequences. The second principle is called nature abhors a vacuum, or in more simpler terms, nature hates an empty space. <laughs> the way that this principle works is that every time we remove negative things from our lives, we're making space for something positive to take its place. It's based on the idea that it is physically impossible to have a completely empty space in your mind and in your life. Something will always fill the space. So to avoid something negative slipping in, it's important to fill the space with po positive things. This is something that I wholeheartedly agree with. And I'm a notorious um, living and breathing example when it comes to the kinds of people that I like to surround myself with. Um, some of you might have been lulled into thinking that I'm a nice, soft person, but I'm not. I'm not. I'm actually quite ruthless about who gets to enter my inner sanctum. Actually, I'm sure that some of my longtime viewers on the Ellie Dreams on another channel might have figured it out by now anyway. I'm, it, it's not much of a secret, but I don't spread myself across lots of other channels. I don't collaborate willy-nilly with just anyone who'll invite me. I don't endorse people or products unless I genuinely believe in them. And I don't get involved in interpersonal drama. I just don't. I'm very selective here in the world of media and I'm also the same in my relationships outside of the media. And I think I've generally been like that for most of my life, definitely my adult life. Anyway, <clears throat> I believe in creating a positive field of energy around myself by attracting positive people and positive experiences. And so I'm likely to spend very little time involving myself in negative experiences or toxic people. And I recall having said to more than a few of my close girlfriends over the years, and I quote, if you aren't happy in your relationship and you haven't been able to fix the relationship, then perhaps you should leave so that you have created space in your life for a good relationship to take its place. And I don't know, <laughs> maybe I'm the weirdo in all of this. I might be because Almost every time I've ever said that to a friend, she'll respond with something along the lines of, oh, I'd rather be in this bad relationship with this so-and-so than be alone. I don't want to be single. <laughs> and you know what? I head off after our lunch or our glass of wine or whatever, and I'm driving home from wherever we were, and I'm shaking my head and muttering to myself and, and thinking, you know, what's wrong with being single? It's great. It's definitely better than being all alone in a relationship with someone else. I mean, it can be really lonely inside a negative relationship with the wrong person. So why not make space in your life by separating yourself from that toxicity so that you can find the right person to fill your void in a positive way? I mean, Am I the only one? Am I being weird here? You let me know. <laughs> so basically nature dictates that a space can't be empty. And so if you fill up your life with positive things, positive people, positive thoughts, then the risk of having negative things, negative people, negative experiences will kind of be diminished. But as I said, there are three principles when it comes to the law of attraction. And the third one is called, um, or it's referred to as the present is always perfect. This idea is based on there always being things that you can do to improve the present moment. Rather than wasting energy feeling a sense of dread or unhappiness, a person should focus their energy on finding ways to make the present moment the best that it can be. So for example, if you hate your job, then don't spend all of your time thinking about how much you hate your job. Instead, direct your energy towards preparing yourself for a better job, looking for a better job, investing your energy in the practical pursuit of a better job. It's likely to get you a better job, which means that the job you hate will ultimately cease to be an issue in your life. Done and dusted. Nothing to worry about. 
So when it comes to the law of attraction and how that relates to worrying, well, worrying is usually based on the projection of a worst case scenario outcome. The law of attraction interprets that worry as being a lack of faith or belief that the thing you're worrying about will come true. And so to compensate for what it perceives to be your lack of faith, the universe will make a point of directing the very thing you're focusing your attention on into your life. And what happens at that point is that you get more of what has, what's been worrying you. So then you end up worrying about it even more, which means that the universe feels compelled to direct even more of it into your life. It becomes a vicious cycle. So the very thing that you're anxious or fearful of will be attracted by your fear more and more, leading to even more fear leading to gr a greater degree of attraction and then even more fear. And this could just continue to go around and around indefinitely until something external, like, you know, I don't know if we're lucky, a meteor or an earthquake or some high profile death or something finally bounces everything out of the cycle. And it's crazy to have to wait for something like a meteor to strike in order for you to get out of a worrying cycle. Why not just shift to positive thought? It's much easier and you don't have to rely on some asteroid event. Okay, so basically all three of these principles are different ways of describing the same thing. And that is that the law of attraction always exists around us. It is in constant motion, whether we are consciously aware of it or not. It can be translated into words like energy distribution or universal responses or vacuums or like for like attractions. It can even be a reply by God, regardless of how it's converted into language that we can understand. The overarching principle is that our frame of mind is always going to affect the manifestation of the circumstances around us. And the more people who are worrying about something negative, the greater the likelihood that the energy being manifested in, into outcomes will be negative too. The remedy for all of this is one simple trick. And I bet you already know what I'm going to say, right? <laughs> really? Think positive. Oh, that's it. Just think positive because positive will bring positive. And the more positive the thoughts and the more people who think positive, the more the manifestation of outcomes surrounding humanity will transform into the positive. Okay, so let's talk about positive thinking. Positive thinking is a very valuable tool in being able to help people when it comes to stress management, overall health and well-being. It can help to combat feelings of low self-esteem. It can improve physical health and it can help to brighten a person's overall sense of there being a bright future to look forward to. But another thing that positive thinking can do is that it helps to relax the mind, which helps to give the brain time to find solutions to the very things that worried us in the first place. Remember how a cornered animal in the fight or flight mode isn't getting sufficient blood, through, uh, blood flow to the brain. So it isn't able to think as logically as it would if it was in a relaxed state. Well, thinking positively can help to put you into a more relaxed state, which means that you will be able to um, solve your problem much easier because the blood's going to your brain. So you might be thinking to yourself, yeah, you know, Ellie, you know, it, it, it isn't fair to say just think positive. How am I supposed to do that? <laughs> All right. So there are a few ways to manage an overactive worrying habit. You could write your worries down. Sometimes it just helps to get them out of your head. Put them down on paper and clear your mind. Once it's down on paper, you can also look at each aspect of the worry individually and work through it one by one. Once it's written down, you can also give yourself permission not to think about it constantly, because if you ever need to think about it and need to remember it, it's right there on your bit of paper. You can look it up anytime you like, which means you can put it there and walk away and then decide, you know, you'll come back later. I actually use this method all the time when I used to work in central government. 
I was um, at one time a high-level policy advisor in policing, and I worked very close to the top. It's a bloodbath at the top, in case you were wondering. (laughs) If you were under the impression that people get nicer and more level-headed and kinder and more reasonable as they progress to the top of their careers and enter into powerful jobs, well, then I'm here to tell you that you are so wrong. The higher up we go on the ladder of success, the worse people get. And when you talk about the hot button of policing and the political environment within central government, then just times all of that by a hundred, maybe even a thousand. The people at the top or who are approaching the top are stressed out. They're suspicious of everything and everyone. They're greedy and they're conniving. And they are so clever about how they attack that you'll never see them coming until you're already dead and six foot under. So every email, every smile that looks a little lopsided, every casual chat over lunch or a quick glass of wine after work is a potential lion's pit of destruction. Don't don't even get me started. Suffice to say, I don't miss that work at all. What I used to do when I got suspiciously subtle hints of malice by email or other kinds of weird maneuvers in the office workplace is that I would go home and I'd write myself a little note about what the issue was and what I would do about it when the time was right. And then I'd let it go. If I need to remember, then I'd just go and look it up in my notes. And when the time was right, then I'd deal with it. It didn't always work because sometimes I'd encounter a person who was better at it than I was, but often it did work. And so I could sleep at night and get on with my life without turning myself into a nervous wreck. But don't get me wrong, I'm still glad to be out. Life is way too short for all of that nonsense and money is not important enough to me uh, to develop an ulcer over those sorts of things. But, you know, if you don't like writing things down, then you can try something else. For example, um, why not a lot 30 minutes of, of the day that you call your worry time? So at 4 p.m., for example, let yourself worry about stuff, but with a focus on finding a solution rather than just worrying aimlessly. And then at 4.30, let it go until tomorrow. You know, set your clock, put an alarm on. I'm not sure it would work for me. Um, But everyone is different. So that kind of a method might work for you. You can also create what psychologists call a worry tree, which I thought was kind of cute, actually. A worry tree is a diagram that takes the shape of a tree. Each branch travels towards a direction of having a solution or being out of your control. You write your worries down on the appropriate branch and then you realize you can actually see with your eyes that Worrying about the things that have no solution or are outside of your control is unnecessary. So you can just let go of that. And then it allows you to focus on the things that you can control. And it helps you to know what to plan a response to. It sounds really simple or simplistic, but I actually think it's really clever. And I think it would be pretty effective, actually. And then there are also things like exercise and meditation, getting outdoors and breathing fresh air, being as physically active as your degree of mobility will allow you to be. So, you know, go for walks or perform activities around your home. Meditation also we need to know, you know, it it can take all kinds of forms. For example, embroidery or knitting are often considered to be forms of meditation, chopping vegetables up really small. Also, things like that, because they focus the mind on small movements that distract from big problems. And of course, you can seek professional help as well, you know, yada, yada. But often just changing the way you approach things that worry you can make all the difference. And it doesn't need to cost you $200 an hour to achieve it. Just put yourself and your well-being first. And with perseverance, the rest of it is very likely to come. It is normal for people to worry a little, but when worry becomes irrational, it begins to distort the energy around the issue. This can lead to negative thought processes, um, catastrophic thinking, self-fulfilling prophecies, and the attraction of negative energy. If a lot of people are out of control worrying about something, that can exacerbate the impact of these things and actually make the massive catastrophic issues that affect many people. 
Just think about those paranoid people out there who fear migrants that they've never met, stockpile weapons that they'll never use in a practical way, stockpile canned goods that they'll never get to eat, spend their money building a fortress that simply isn't based in a reality up here on earth, making themselves miserable, distrusting everyone around them, all of the rules, their entire government, um, their entire country sometimes. These people are people who are creating a reality out of their worries. Life is too short for that. And humanity survives on positive outcomes. So bringing it for a moment back to that very first topic that I mentioned, which was the panic and hand-wringing over the presidential debate. What is the point of all the worrying? Because really, there's only one thing that is within the control of each individual who has a choice of either worrying or not. You can either worry endlessly, which really isn't a choice because it's not productive, it's not going to achieve anything positive, or you can make a determination. As an individual living in the United States who has a chance to vote in November, you have an action. Just perform the action. That's all you need to worry about. The rest of it, put it to bed. And if you want to do more, then convince others to perform that action as well. And then you no longer need to worry. You can spend the rest of your time filling up that empty space with positive energy. So remember, first and foremost, the wonderful saying that everyone's grandmother once told them. It's like a universal grandma thing. It's simple and it's very true. And the message is, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. This too shall pass. In the meantime, our job is to do the best that we can. So think positive and don't worry. Thanks to everyone who's watching on one of KGRA's broadcasting platforms. If you'd like to become a member of the KGRA family so that you can chat as you view any of the KGRA shows, radio shows with like-minded spiritualists, experiences and weirdos like me, then don't forget to use promo code Ellie for 30% off your subscription. That's it for today. It's been a pleasure. Until next time.